Let's see. Thank you so much uh, for the excellent energy uh, in which you've run the whole week, uh, Julie. Colleagues, how fitting it is to have the last session of our forum on protection case management. At the end, uh, the measure of our work is simple. Did we manage to prevent harm, support the resilience of someone to slide back into normality and take care of themselves and their own? That's it, that's the measure. So how fitting it is to close our forum today with this session. We did open the forum by saying that what hurts the most for survivors of protection crimes goes beyond the crime itself. It is invisibility. Millions of people go through all their challenges in total solitude, wondering if anyone knows or cares, wondering if they matter at all. And how fitting it is after we have gone through several discussions, 12 this week, to come back full circle and say, whatever the challenges are and the reasons for them is, and partnerships we build to combat them, at the end, we have this one simple powerful tool to knock out invisibility, recognize the individual and address the challenges, case management. Protection case management is a core program, a non-negotiable element of protection response efforts. I can't be clearer. It's not an add-on or simply something that is nice to have. Instead, it's a key tool to support protection outcomes for some of the most at-risk members of the community living in displacement or in crisis. And managing cases is not uh, a general, generic function. It's a specialized area of intervention requiring technical staff, specialized staff and guidance. Why? Well, because the risk of doing harm when ill-equipped is as great as the opportunity of finding a solution if well-equipped. Well thought through and resourced case management system could be the difference between protecting and doing harm. Now the interagency guidelines developed in 2019 on protection case management with thanks to IRC and UNHCR and many partners who supported them are an essential piece as we across the protection cluster look to further socialize protection case management and support different protection leaders, particularly at local and national levels, to take such programming in ways that fully ensure the do no harm approach at its core. So in opening this final session, I'm proud of your discussions throughout the week. I'm proud of the amount of work that is behind these discussions, the actual work on the ground that allows us to bring our experiences to forums like this. And I am proud that we are a sector that can debate global challenges, advocate at the Security Council, develop policies and systems. But at the end, we go back to the one day-to-day -day focus that drives us all, the dignity of the individual. So let's more hear more from the panelists today how we're going to do that in this, should I call it protection in practice session. Thank you and have a good, good session. Um, thank you so much, William. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, my name is Hannah Jordan and I am the Regional Protection Advisor for NRC in our Asia, Europe and Latin America region. And I have the honor of moderating today's event shaping protection case management, identifying challenges and opportunities um, alongside Emily Krem, um, our colleague at IRC. Emily, do you wanna introduce yourself? 
Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Emily Krem, and I'm a Protection Rule of Law Technical Advisor with IRC, normally based in New York, but currently in Uganda. Um, thanks so much for the intro. We're really excited for this session today. Great. Next slide, please. Just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, unless you're a speaker, please kindly mute your microphone. We would love to see you. So if the bandwidth is good enough, please keep your video on. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please um, type it in the chat box. And while our speakers are presenting, I will be looking at the questions for having a little bit of Q&A at the end. Um, please also type into the chat what country you're working in and what organization you're with. And then please don't forget the translation at the bottom. So we have French and Spanish um, with us today. And yeah, so next slide, please. The agenda, we just, today what we wanna do is go over protection case management. So we'll have some overview on protection case management in the NHCR, and then we'll go through an introduction to the new approach. Then we'll pass it off to our colleague in Uganda and he will discuss a coordinated and system strengthening response in protection case management. Then we'll pass it off to our colleague um, with humanitarian mind action. We'll look at victim assistance. Um, and then the last panelist will look at challenges and opportunities. And then if we have some time, we'll do some question and answer and next steps and wrapping up. Next slide. I think I've just introduced, I'll let the, the panelists introduce themselves and I will pass it over to Emily. Great, thanks so much, Anna. So next slide. So today, I'm not sure if you can really see, but this is really a sort of a global map of where protection case management is already taking place. Uh, we talked about these release of these new guidelines, but the guidelines were a result of um, really a need on the ground and this is already happening in loads of areas. Now as you will see this is very IRC and NRC heavy so this is clearly not an indication of where all of the work is being done and we're very interested in hearing from you where this is actually happening um, organically. So please do um, let us know and we'd be really thrilled to um, understand how this is um, taking place on the ground. Next slide. So you will hear in a moment from Esther, who is going to talk about um, why protection case management or how it really came about um, and why, why this took place. Um, but just to give a little bit of a background um, that William mentioned is this started happening sort of organically without a standardized guidance, at least for IRC, in Lebanon and Uganda, um, starting in 2018. In 2019, IRC developed a first guidance or a first draft of this. Um, however, we felt upon reflection that it was really more of um, framed in the negative, that it was not gender-based violence case management, and it was not case management for children. It didn't really have, um, it didn't really articulate who we were supporting in a clear way. The response was not case management for men. It was something more nuanced than that, but we weren't really articulating it in a in a clear way. In starting in late 2019 and finish in 2020, IRC and UNHCR collaborated uh, to develop the first multi-agency protection case management guidance. Um, and we're lucky enough to have a number of those people who really worked on this guidance all presenting today on this call. Um, you'll see Esther, Dennis, and myself all contributed to this guidance and it was actually led um, by Colette Hogg, who I will be handing off to in a moment. Um, these guidelines really emphasize the importance that we shift as a sector and as an industry from a charity-based model to more of a rights-based approach. And Esther will go into that in a little bit more detail. Next slide, please. Great. So here it really just um, emphasizes that while this was initially created by uh, IRC and UNHCR, it was much more than that. And there was a reference group that included um, IMC, DRC, uh, as much as possible. This is really meant to be an interagency or a multi-agency approach. Um, the guidance aims to bring together the wider protection community to provide a common language, standardized definitions, tools and approaches across the agencies that would like to engage in this approach. We're not quite there yet in terms of mandating everybody uses the exact same tools and the exact same language, but really, really hope that it's a start. It's a start to have that common framing. Um, 
And we hope that this approach will be piloted and it is being piloted, which Hannah will speak to a little bit at the end um, in multiple countries. So thank you so much. And I am very excited to introduce Colette Hogg, who will be speaking a little bit um, about how UNHCR's role around protection case management. Thank you, Emily. Um, and it's great to be on the um, webinar today. So thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I, as Emily said, am Colette Hogg um, and working as the Interim Protection Sets Coordinator for the moment with the interagency um, in Lebanon. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, in terms of protection case management and UNHCR, um, William spoke very passionately at the beginning about how protection case management is part of UNHCR's mandate um, to provide protection for displaced persons and vulnerable individuals. So protection case management and this guidance is a really important step towards achieving that, that uh, broader protection mandate. Um, and then also to providing and you know, supporting people to realize and find durable solutions by enabling those self-protective capacities um, and, and self-reliance um, pending you know, a longer term solution. Um, protection case management is one of the uh, core components of UNHCR's border protection response, as you can see here, um, all of which needs to be you know, appropriately coordinated um, and connected to. Um, the protection case management guidance um, is really an essential guidance for our work. Typically, UNHCR, you know, outside of the child protection and um, SGBV case management models has tended to act as a sort of broker um, or a central hub through which people approach and which we kind of respond um, to by providing a one-off uh, service or um, kind of advocacy action uh, for. But perhaps without the uh, psychosocial accompaniment piece to that, um, and, and perhaps without a clear direction as to the steps and the attitudes required. Um, so um, we haven't, say, typically viewed this as part of a broader um, empower, empower, uh, empowering process um, where we can support individuals to really heal and make decisions. So this isn't to say that uh, case management hasn't and isn't being done in, in UNHCR, of course it is, and that's very much part of what we do and of course um, what implementing partners do. But I think as, as Emily referred to, there hasn't been until now uh, specific guidance uh, through which we can um, follow and, uh, and provide more support um, to, to staff with. Um, so these components, um, of UNHC. So yes, I mean, these are the components here that relate to uh, case management within a refugee, but also IDP setting. Um, and uh, as you can see through the diagram, um, and they uh, should be connected at each of those stages. So just a little bit in terms of how this fits in um, to, to UNHCR's interventions. Thanks a lot, Emily. Great. Thank you so much for that, Colette. Um, now I'd like to pass over to Esther, who is going to take us to our next set of slides. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so today I will try in this section of the presentation to actually talk about who are our clients and how this guidance contributed uh, significantly in framing the scope of work when we're talking about protection case management. So let me start with a short case study um, that you can see right now on the slide. Um, in that case study, you um, have Mrs. Baby. She's 50 years old. She lives with three adult daughters and two grandchildren. Um, she has epilepsy, but she's untreated and undiagnosed. Uh, and she lives in a community where um, witchcraft is a belief. Um, she's supported by her family, but she seems to be more and more isolated and she's not um, doing the activities she used to do, um, such as sewing. Um, her health status seems to worsen um, and 
he had a seizure lately. Um, and in the society and the community, as I mentioned, where she lives in, um, local councils are trying to crack down um, people practicing witchcraft. And they are associated, Mrs. Bibi, to witchcraft. Um, and the family is very concerned about being attacked, attacked especially at night, um, because they think Mrs. Bibi might be practicing um, witchcraft. Um, we started with that case study um, to highlight and outline some of the cases. This is not an isolated um, case or a story. Um, we encountered a lot of this story in the field. And initially, as it was mentioned by my colleagues, um, I think case management was well outlined and articulated when it came to maybe child protection or gender-based violence. And a lot of investment has been done in those two um, fields of expertise. But for Mrs. Bibi, you can sense from the start that maybe these two case management activities were not um, like fit for purpose, like they would, Mrs. Bibi wouldn't be eligible. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I, oh, sorry. <laughs> Hannah. Yeah, Esther. I think, can we go to next slide, please? Um, sorry. Did we mess up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I started with that case study just to introduce that maybe um, initially we had some of a sense of a gap in services. Um, and if CP and GDV were well articulated, as I mentioned, um, the story of Mrs. Bibi and Mrs. Bibi, for example, was not um, covered. So having discussions in the field and being in the field with teams, um, I am a former protection coordinator for the IRC. We really sensed that something was missing. We were not covering all the needs and all um, the stories and difficulties and challenges faced by um, clients and population we aimed at serving in the field. Um, it was recognized progressively by um, clusters and organizations in discussions, and we had also a growing demand from clients. So we would do other protection activities like protection monitoring or information dissemination or other type of prevention and response in the field. And we would have more and more people seeking for support, and we didn't have like clear guidance or clear frame to actually respond to their needs. Um, progressively, donors' interest was also growing and those discussions were shifting also in um, talking with donors. Donors would um, question us about, okay, you are doing child protection case management, you're doing GBV case management, but how do you actually respond to other um, rights violation? For example, in our case study, how do you actually respond and support population when there is a witchcraft accusation and a risk of uh, physical assault or other rights violation? Um, next slide, please. I think that one of the major challenge when you're in the field and um, um, working in a rush and sometimes being in an emergency, you don't have uh, the time. Most of the time it's very complicated to pose and actually try to translate standards into practice and have the time to develop like comprehensive tools um, embedding those standards. Um, and I think this is one of the major strengths of this guidance. Um, as it is really the results of lessons learned over the years. I remember having discussion like in 2017 being in Cameroon and organically starting to um, um, develop um, case management activities, but let's say general protection case management and not specialized for children or gender-based violence survivors. I think one of the major strengths of this guidance, and I cannot go into all the standards which are outlined there, I will just focus on who we serve and how we frame the scope of work uh, in terms of clients. 
Um, the three um, standards that you see on that slide being having a human rights based approach, uh, being protection sensitive, and William referred to it talking about the do no harm principle, um, for example, or being inclusive, having including pro pro including protection case management services is one of the major strengths. I think this is something which was well outlined and actually um, um, highlighted through the processes and tools that you will find in that guidance. Um, I cannot go into the details of each and every um, and standard, but when we're saying that we have a human rights based approach, right, it's saying that you're seeing your clients as right holders and not as vulnerable as vulnerable persons. And the major um, shift of this guidance in terms of perspective and focus is really trying to shift away from persons with specific needs categories as an entry point for protection case management. Back then we had other guidance and a lot of work was done already in terms of um, what is protection case management, but I think um, the main um, entry point for stakeholders was to use the person with specific needs categories. So let's say, um, if you were to communicate with uh, counterparts and that counterpart would ask you, uh, who are you serving? The first answer would be, oh, we work with persons with specific needs. And then we would rely on that list uh, being, oh, we work with uh, older persons. You know, we work with persons with disabilities. We work with persons with um, serious medical condition and so on and so forth. And this guidance and all the work which has been done uh, being the results of discussion is to say we shift away from um, those categories which can actually uh, entail a component of um, discrimination um, saying assuming from the start that uh, per, we would have groups of the categories having specific needs no we have persons having all the same needs um, and we have sometimes an environment um, bringing obstacles and barriers for them to actually enjoy their rights uh, fully. So this is shifting away from that perspective and saying that protection case management is actually working with persons at protection risk, which is a, a, a significant uh, a shift and I will really focus on that. Um, that guidance includes, of course, uh, ways and tools to incorporate protection principles and make sure we design safe, dignified, participative, and so on and so forth, protection case management services. Um, and it does also a real focus on being inclusive and trying to remove to the best possible extent the barriers to our services, but also consider barriers um, in the protection risk analysis we um, are doing. Um, saying that, um, and coming back to how it does relate to how we frame who we serve um, with this guidance. Um, next slide, please. It means that we are um, actually grounding um, our response and our protection case management response into a thorough, like in-depth protection analysis. If we want to um, see our clients as right holders and not only as assuming, okay, we are working with vulnerable person, going to these categories of people, we need to have a clear understanding of power dynamic and dynamic within the communities we're working in. And it goes with doing a protection risk analysis. So the process that the guidance is supporting is for you in the field to um, one, do a protection risk analysis for you to prioritize what would be the priority, the prioritized rights violation we are going to respond to through case management and then have very clear targeting um, criteria. Um, and those targeting criteria, of course, this is then the entry point and for you to communicate with um, other stakeholders, um, other um, service providers. Um, maybe from um, like 
it, it, it might look um, kind of complicated and we might be tempted to be, that may be easier to refer to categories of person with specific needs, for example. Um, but I just wanted to share here uh, quickly my experience um, working with those categories, just very operationally. Um, doing this, you will um, sometimes end up, and I don't know, maybe guys, you have had the same experience, um, you, it will result in a high number if, in, in, of referrals because um, what I observe is that all the individuals um, who did not fit GBV or CPK's management criteria would be referred to protection case management. So if you would um, say in a coordination meeting, I'm, I am delivering as an organization protection case management, most of the people not fitting the criteria of CP and GBV case management would end up in your caseload, um, which would be uh, a real stretch to case, case worker, uh, very complicated to respond to all the needs you, you of clients in a qualitative way. Um, and finally, uh, it would lead sometimes to an overlap with basic um, needs stakeholders mandate and make you shift from the core mandate as William actually referred to in the introduction. We are here as protection stakeholder to prevent and respond to violence and rights violation. And most of the time the referral might be that people would refer to you people in an economic vulnerability making your caseload grow. And I'm not saying that those people are not in need of support, they are. But as protection stakeholders, you're really there to respond to violence and protection risks. So that's why this process and this guidance is critical, I think, to frame the way we are actually saying who we serve and we are serving um, person at protection risk. And we need to do a protection risk analysis to know what it means in the community we work in, because it might differ significantly from one country to the other, and even from one village to the other in the same country. Um, next slide, please. So uh, just as a reminder, and just to emphasize what's uh, contained in this guidance, when we are saying that we are uh, doing a protection risk analysis, this guidance is going to support you uh, really in doing it balancing um, risk and protective factors. Uh, I think we all, always have a tendency being in emergencies or in a rush of doing our program management or project management to sometimes focus a lot on risk factors, uh, the threat and, 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 and the risk uh, factors people are exposed to, let's say like the negative part. This guidance has tried to the best possible extent to also um, outline and make sure in the way you are analyzing your environment and the risk people are exposed to, you also take into consideration protective factors, which is critical to make sure you have actually a human rights-based approach and you are also having an employment approach. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. So um, I just wanted to finish this um, presentation by showing you one example of a template that you'll have um, in this guidance um, to help you out doing this process of starting to, from the protection risk analysis, prioritization, and then having your targeting criteria. Um, here, the example is about um, arbitrary arrest and detention. Um, taking, it, taking it as a right violation of protection risk, you will be analyzing with your team. Um, and so on the left side, you see that you have examples of how your rights violation or the protection risk might manifest in your context. And this is very important important to reflect as a team on like, okay, we have arbitrary rest and detention. How does it manifest? How does it look like in my context? 
to help you out, um, the template will have the definition at the international level of what we're talking about. What does it mean when, when we are talking of arbitrary arrest in detention? At the international level, of course, you can adapt it with your national legal framework uh, when suitable. And the main part is at the bottom and you have the three columns being um, giving examples and um, try to understand um, the environmental risk factors, the causal uh, agents and root causes. Um, so what is um, making, um, what is creating the protection risk in your environment, in the environment the population lives in? Here as example, you have negative social attitude, checkpoints, mined by security forces, regular raids by security forces. And then you'll analyze what are the risk factors at individual level, meaning age, gender, diversity factors uh, that people might be exposed to. So in this example, you have, for example, like if I am lacking a nationality, I am undocumented, I am not registered as a refugee, for example, I might be more at risk of being arrested or detained in that specific context. If I am a man, I might be more exposed, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last uh, column is helping you out think through the protective factors, as I mentioned before. So, for example, if you're living in a urban area, you might be less exposed because there are less checkpoints. If you're registered or if you have um, documentation, you might be less exposed, etc. So those are examples of protective factors. Going back to that process, you would do that for the guidance is supporting you actually doing that for each and every rights violation and you have a list of it and once you've done it um, you will have um, the possibility to actually prioritize what rights violation you're going to respond to through your protection case management activity um, according to some criteria such as uh, what is the severity and impact of that right violation where we are intervening? What's the relevance of case management response? And what is um, the coordination landscape? What are other service providers uh, giving in that same area so that you can avoid, for example, duplication? And what are your capacities as an organization to actually respond properly to that right violation in a protection sensitive way? Um, so that was my part to try to explain what's the process in that guidance, so how you can frame who we serve and what are actually the tools and um, that you can find in that guidance. And to conclude, I would say that really this guidance is the result of lessons learned in the field and making sure that we are supporting um, practitioners in the field to actually translate standards into practice in the most uh, easiest way. Um, it covers, this guidance will help you cover a gap in services in the protection response by having um, articulated protection case management. Um, it will, um, and it will also make sure uh, you ground your services in, a, in, in, in an in-depth understanding of where you're intervening it by doing a protection risk analysis. Um, thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for that, Esther. That's amazing. We have some questions that have come out, but I have noted those down and we'll keep those for the end. So I would like to pass over to, um, to Dennis. Dennis, on to you. Thank you and hi everyone. Um, Dennis Seluk, the Deputy Protection Coordinator with the IRC Uganda Country Program. Um, in this next round of presentation, we'll be looking at uh, a coordinated and system strengthening response in Uganda. But just to start off our presentation, I want to give a very brief, brief general overview of the Ugandan context. Uganda, as it's known, is a country in East Africa, which currently hosts the, the greatest number of refugees out of all the African countries. And this perhaps may be due to their open door uh, refugee policy. The government has actually um, made welcoming and caring for refugees an important part of its national policy. And the approach here involves welcoming relatively anyone seeking refuge or asylum in the country, regardless of 
the country of origin. Uh, but just also note that um, Uganda um, is a post-conflict country, and that has transitioned from war that lasted over 20 years of the Lord's Resistance Army in the Northern Uganda. And this eventually saw more than uh, 1.8 million internally, internally displaced persons uh, move into approximately 251 camps and other protected villages to now becoming one of the largest um, a refugee hosting country, hosting the largest number of refugees. And as I talk now, uh, within the year 2021, we have approximately about 1.4 million refugees of different nationalities. And this includes the South Sudan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, Somalia, Burundi, among others. And all these uh, refugees from the different countries are being hosted in a close to 11 settlements across the different regions of the country. But um, other than that, we see Uganda also experiencing other ongoing crises, just like any other uh, part of the world, uh, notably the uh, global pandemic, COVID, the non-COVID disease outbreaks, for example, measles and polio, among others. But now in terms of protection case management, as already hinted by Emily, uh, we did start this in the year 2018 through a phased out rollout plan, um, which included, among others, the community building, uh, the capacity building uh, training for our protection team. And now, as we talk, we have protection case management being delivered in five program implementation locations, which includes both the urban setting um, and the settlement. Settlement I established more say in the uh, rural outskirts of the of the country. So given this uh, brief uh, background, I would wish to point that we have seen um, our operating context increasingly urging us to deliver programs by sharing and building capacity with local and national actors to ensure sustainability, which is one of the um, a key part of system strengthening response approach as we proceed. Next slide. Um, so we, we look at case management and system strengthening as a direct service uh, delivery in line with about three key themes as, been, as has been pointed. Um, the first area is around the, mob, uh, the moral obligation. And so here we do appreciate that um, states have the primary responsibility for social services to provide identity and ensure support provision. So we continue to ensure that the localization agenda in humanitarian work is implemented. We must be able to consider how they support, how we support the existing systems in the existing context where we work to provide such um, needed support. Um, the other area is around the contextual necessity. Um, as already given by the previous presenter, protection case management programming is implemented in a range of contexts um, lying in the form of emergency, the IDP setup, the refugee setup, the demand driven uh, context, just to mention but a few, that tends to address fear and vulnerabilities many of which intersect the humanitarian and the development spheres. So particularly in Uganda, we have seen a sort of a shift away from the protection programming where we look at our response, not only in one angle, um, but rather in a multifaceted approach as in not any response is the same and no one size fits all. So the settlements in Uganda have some of which have existed over 20 years, and in other in over 20 years in other instances with refugees uh, you know producing children and having children to go in those settlements and we continue to have um, spontaneous new arrivals coming in country through the porous borders of the country uganda being really a landlocked country so we also have refugees integrated into the urban host communities, necessarily not a settlement, but people who have found their ways to live in this urban location, while others live in the designated settlements. So given the complexities around the context, perhaps 
this could be one of the fronted reasons for multi-layered approach that we determine in terms of ensuring the protection and the system strengthening approach around our work. The aspect of sustainability is more um, effective response to address uh, things in a sort of a systematic way that uh, can get to the root of the problem. Now, as the IRC in our program, we do try as much as possible to appreciate the fundamental role of government in the international refugee and humanitarian framework that obligates states to protect and ensure service um, delivery. However, from the works we have done and perhaps in other country programs that you could have witnessed, sometimes the government is overwhelmed with demands and this is one sole reason that warrants CSOs to come in to support. For example, in cases of influxes, in the case of Uganda, we have had situations of natural disasters, but it's important that we come and share best practices and adaptability and also coupled with um, joint research uh, ventures and intervention. So as such, we see INGOs becoming very um, fundamental and playing a fundamental role in this process. Now, just again, slightly on that aspect of sustainability, if I have to throw more light in the Ugandan context, it, sustainability is considered for both the people which I think should be the best practice, um, not only in Uganda, but for any other program, um, for both the people and the system where humanitarian actors should be seen as a temporary gap filler for the state systems that are kind of unwilling or perhaps are unable to fulfill the obligation of protecting and ensuring service delivery for the people. And as we do this, it is important to think through um, a sort of the eventual withdrawal and transfer of services right from the beginning of our programming, okay, or the start of our program, if we really have to um, uh, attain the aspect of sustainability. But as we do all this, we know that we cannot support forever as humanitarian workers. There is need to build capacity of the government, system holders through undertaking the necessary training ensuring that we work around as much as possible, build efforts around coalition and help to set up systems and standards that will enable or contribute to popularizing the best practices. Um, for example, or for instance, in refugee management among others. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, in Uganda, again, we have the overall um, coordination office, uh, that is the office of the prime minister, which, sorry, previous slide. I think there's a sort of delay in the previous slide, sorry, oh yes. There, right there, thank you. So the office of the prime minister is charged with the overall coordination role around refugee programming. However, we system strengthening is not only about the government, but also about the community structures. And this includes both the formal and the informal structures and working towards integrating all this together. So we see that integrating both the formal and the informal systems is important for referrals and for negotiating solutions in some cases for the clients where civil society complements the work of the government. As the IRC Uganda, we have tried as much as possible to engage local national organizations. I can make reference to Uganda Network on Law, Ethics, and HIV AIDS, that is UGANET, but also at a more national level, we have the Center for Justice Studies and Innovation, and perhaps also getting down at the refugee settlement level to work very closely and strengthen the capacity of the Refugee Welfare Council members, the state and non state actors to be able to deliver on these aspects of the work as part of the sustainable approach. As we know, the government and the civil society both have different strengths in case management. For instance, um, the civil society work in refugee settlements, majorly, 
and then also the government have different access to power. So we should find ourselves working closely to tap onto all these components. There is a need as such to strengthen the government and civil society and ensure that they are brought together to foster a sort of information exchange, building common understanding of the problems, designing solutions together and capacity sharing. Again, as an example, we have done this in Uganda through a refugee engagement forum platform. And this is a platform that brings together all the refugee representatives from across the 11 refugee settlements that I mentioned about or talked about at this in the previous slide to deliberate on issues, on challenges, uh, on some of these areas that they need support from government and civil society so that their life continues and their rights are not violated in this case. Um, because a lot of our clients also intersect with the legal aspects, we have tried as much as possible to explore opportunities around court open days, which has contributed significantly to scalable innovations and best practices, including showcasing of expertise on how we can differently uh, work. Um, so in all this, as we try to do this, it is important to emphasize that um, as humanitarian workers, and in this case, particularly IRC and all the other organizations, we are just mere facilitators and not owners or drivers of system strengthening, but rather the actual system users in this case, who are the people, are the key drivers to bring change and advocate on issues affecting them, both in terms of the demand and on the supply angle, each have a role to play to strengthen the systems for refugees in this case. However, as we try to do all this, there are challenges that come along with such. And for example, um, there are aspects to do with around changing attitudes, practices, and mindset, which in other instances is very, very difficult. We know systems are driven by the people. So for example, there could be the government structures that we try to work on closely have primary interest in refugee work and issues around land are cropping up, up in the refugee hosting districts, just to mention. And again, as we do this, it's important um, as a challenge that they are dealing with the winners, a sort of winners and losers in system strengthening. So every system has defenders. So need to identify and address the fears and vested interests of these defenders and the losers. Otherwise, if this is not identified at the earlier stage, you are bound to you know, experience a lot more challenges than what it exists. And of course, around this, we know system strengthening sometimes requires hardware investments, which comes with a lot more additional resources than we can think. For example, in cases of automation, training and capacity building, which requires a lot more of continuous engagement. And indeed, it's not a one-off uh, approach. Next slide. <clears throat> Yeah, so again, before talking about system strengthening, we need to understand that the gaps, what the gaps are, and how do you go about system strengthening upon identifying the gaps. There's need for a general assessment to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the prevailing system. So it is important as we try as much as possible to do this, to have a self-reflection on what our value add is by, for example, focusing on building the skills and attitudes. For the case of Uganda, um, we have considered working with the government with the lead coordination role, the OPM, Office of the Prime Minister, but also other duty bearers to support clients in a much more trauma-centered and client-centered way, which is one of the key things that. In the other aspect is to consider programmatic approach and tools. Um, there's a need to support civil society that has already been working with these groups. So as to do so in a much more systematic way, using, for example, the tools. Um, in the case of, in our case, we have done this using the tools developed in the protection case management guidance. And in this, I make reference to our work with, again, the Center for Justice Studies and Innovation, which is a national NGO. We built onto their skills and expertise under one of the projects um, that looked at enhancing, empowering, 
and strengthening central government and district capacity. And this basically was delivered through workshops to understand and harmonize linkages between government systems, not in a range of spheres of social protection, humanitarian protection case management, database handling, and more. So we still think that this still remains an area to advocate on, especially around the challenges of harmonization. But this is something that we hope to replicate as we continue to strengthen our case management practice in the next future. Advocacy is a very important component that we need to consider on with the government so that they are able to include uh, groups that might be otherwise excluded from service provision. You know? So in Uganda, again, we have capitalized this based on um, the enjoyment of the comprehensive and progressive refugee framework that, that we have. Perhaps it's one of the best in the world, coupled with the good policies that we have in place. And looking at the way things, the trend of things, there's already a transition from the emergency to development. And, and as we try to fit ourselves into this, it's no longer deliver and go away, but take into play empowering approaches to refugee self-reliance that leads to independence. And lastly, around this, we, it's about exchanging knowledge and experience. For this to be built, let's consider working with actual members of the groups themselves, for example, in the case of the marginalized groups, and facilitate sessions where uh, you can bring the duty bearers together with those groups directly, if at all we find it is safe and accessible for them, but also take into consideration the ability to reevaluate with the team, foster reflections, and remember that, again, at the back of our mind, that one solution might not be relevant for all the challenges and the problems that we have. And as such, it is important to remember that we are not the experts. So we have to facilitate, be facilitators of the process where we need to learn from the people we are working with, but also as much as they are learning from us. Next slide. So protection case management is at the center of different service intervention for both the specialized and non-specialized services. And therefore, it is important to work and coordinate with other protection actors along several areas. And some of these areas include the targeting criteria, developing, coordinating the targeting criteria for the individuals in need, you know, having to undertake joint case conferences, referrals, and you know, including sharing of experiences and learning among others. So again, for for, for instance, as we try to do this, there could be very complex situations. Uh, for instance, uh, how do we coordinate if there are overlaps with the GBV case load? For example, male survivors of sexual violence, or if someone who had previously um, identified a protection risk discloses that she's experiencing uh, intimate, intimate partner violence. So how do you deal with such situation? Um, I think in, it's in, in all these cases, there is need to make sure that um, each case management stream knows what the targeting criteria is. It is important to know that a client should not be enrolled in two different case management programs at the same time. And a client should only have one primary case worker, which is a, the basic principle and guideline. However, you must ask the client what their preference is. This could be something that is put on paper, but what is the preference of the client? If um, it often might be the case worker that um, has the ongoing relationship with the client, so as to remain the main case worker, so that the client doesn't have to retell or recall their story several times, which could lead to more harm than it should be deserving. But rather coordinate closely with the other case management team to ensure appropriate services are in place to respond to the risk they are exposed to. So for me, I think this is a perfect way of how we can coordinate with other actors. For the IRS Uganda, we are privileged in other areas of cooperation to have um, different services available within the organization. For example, when you talk about GBV, you talk about child protection, you talk about access to justice in terms of the legal MHPS. We have this entirely within the organization as the IRS. So, so it is rather important, easy to coordinate and all that. However, in other instances, there could be challenges um, in such scenarios. 
and this could lead um, be issues around overlapping criteria for the mental health and psychosocial support. And also in other instances, the perception uh, that people have built, other people have built that protection case management is, you know, uh, geared towards supporting perpetrators of violence, uh, you know, other than supporting um, the victim in this case. Next slide. So again, just like in the previous uh, section, it still pre puts protection case management at the center of different service intervention for the specialized and unspecialized. But as already put previously, it's important for coordination. In this case, not only with other protection actors, but other sectors, which is key. And the areas of coordination still very importantly to note is around uh, referrals, is around advocacy, is around inclusion, but also you can build further issues around research and documentation. I've already talked about innovative, scalable uh, pilots among others. If I have to pick one of a case study in one of the settlements where we work in, we received this um, um, client who entered Uganda through the Democratic Republic of Congo, but way back uh, in his home, uh, during his attempt to run away from the, 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 the situation or insecurity that was in the country, he got shot and later his legs, his two legs uh, got amputated. So he reached Uganda and he didn't have legs, so he would be carried and all that. Having been relocated to the settlement, given a plot where to live and there's temporary house where to start living, he could keep on crying, 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 feeling as if um, he has become so useless to the world. He had nothing now to mean to him to be alive in the world. He, way back in his um, country, he was a tailor. He could no longer do anything to fend for his for himself and a few other family members he had moved with. So in such a situation that our team were able to identify, we started to engage slowly, slowly with other sectors, um, for in this case, the health team, at first to be able to see how this gentleman can be supported. Medical assessments conducted, you know, and eventually was recommended for an artificial limb, which was eventually delivered to him. But to ensure that his life continued you know, as any other human being, we thought it would be important to link him to the livelihood sector to see how, you know, he can further his life along these areas. And I must really also say that with, with the livelihood uh, partner and sector in the settlement, um, around his needs was if he could be given a, tailor, a tailoring, um, tailoring machine because he was a tailor back in his country. This was eventually issued to him. He started his stall around his home and people started bringing their different clothes around his him. And so we see that there has been a transition sort of with this coordination, with the health sector, with the livelihood to ensure that this gentleman continue to live a meaningful life um, and, 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 and this has helped so much. So that even if IRC or another sector leaves, the settlement tomorrow will still be able to see all this gentleman continue to fend for himself and the family. So there's that self-reliance for that. So ladies and gentlemen, um, this is what I had for you. Thank you and over to Johanna. Thank you so much, Dennis. I think it's fantastic that you brought in at the very end, linking with other sectors and really working together as a humanitarian community. And on that note, um, I would like to pass it over to Henri. Henri, are you there? Yeah, can Thanks. you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, okay. Merci, Anna. Uh, je vais parler en français, donc ça va changer un peu. Euh, l'oreille euh, euh, de la présentation. Euh, je suis Henri, je travaille pour euh, UN Mine Action Service, une masse. Euh, je suis conseiller euh, en opération euh, et plus spécialement pour les opérations d'assistance aux victimes, qui est euh, l'un des cinq piliers euh, de l'action contre les mines. Euh, je, je, je vous remercie euh, tout d'abord d'avoir euh, associé le secteur euh, de l'action contre les mines à, à cet événement, à ce webinaire, et je vous remercie de, de me donner euh, 
l'opportunité de, de présenter euh, ce que une masse euh, développe euh, ces, jours, ces, ces mois derniers euh, et notamment dans le, dans le cadre de la protection. Euh, comme vous le savez, les acteurs euh, de l'action contre les mines euh, interviennent dans des environnements euh, où il y a de la violence armée, des victimes de cette violence armée euh, et des risques de protection euh, aiguë. Euh, personnellement, je conseille les programmes de Syrie, euh, du nord-est du Nigeria et tout récemment euh, d'Afghanistan. Euh, dans tous ces contextes-là, nous, euh, nous devons faire face à des populations qui sont euh, confrontées quotidiennement euh, aux explosions d'engins explosifs, euh, mines, engins explosifs improvisés euh, et autres euh, explosives ordnance euh, en anglais. J'ai une expérience euh, d'ergothérapeute, occupational therapist euh, en anglais. Euh, je suis spécialisé dans la prise en charge des blessés et des personnes handicapées. Euh, le lien est assez logique entre l'assistance aux victimes et le handicap, et euh, dans le domaine de l'action contre les mines, euh, les victimes directes euh, d'accidents, euh, d'engins explosifs, euh, bien souvent développent des handicaps euh, qu'ils vont garder toute leur vie. Euh, les acteurs de l'action contre les mines n'ont pas vocation à être euh, des acteurs de case management. Euh, les activités principales de l'action contre la mine sont l'éducation au risque, euh, sont la clearance, le déminage, euh, l'advocacy, euh, la gestion de stock de munitions euh, et puis l'assistance aux victimes. Euh, mais les standards qui existent aujourd'hui et qui sont de plus en plus développés, limite l'action de des acteurs de, de l'action contre la mine euh, à de l'identification de victimes, euh, de l'orientation et de l'information. Euh, si possible, on pourrait aller jusqu'au référent, au référencement, euh, mais cela nécessite euh, des formations particulières euh, pour les équipes de terrain. Je vous donne un exemple. Tout récemment a été euh, euh, édité la première version de l'International Mine Action Standard euh, pour l'assistance aux victimes euh, au mois d'octobre euh, de cette année, donc vraiment euh, tout récemment. Euh, et ça donne un cadre aux acteurs euh, euh, de l'action contre les mines euh, qui va au-delà de juste identifier les victimes. C'est une problématique qui a été soulevée par de nombreux acteurs, à savoir que les équipes de, de liaison de, de communautés et les équipes d'éducation au risque se rendaient dans des communautés pour certaines activités, identifiaient des victimes, collectaient des données et s'arrêtaient là. Les acteurs d'action contre les mines sont des acteurs de protection. Et donc, ils ont une responsabilité qui est euh, au-delà de collecter de la donnée, au moins d'informer euh, sur les services disponibles et accessibles euh, autour des victimes et d'autres personnes euh, qui ont des besoins similaires. Euh, il a donc été introduit dans les standards d'éducation au risque et de victimes assistance une notion de référol, d'orientation et de mapping de services de manière à ce que les acteurs de l'action contre les mines jouent ce rôle de première étape dans le case management qui va être d'identifier et d'orienter vers le bon service. Et aujourd'hui, cela nécessite des ressources additionnelles puisqu'il faut former les équipes de terrain. Il faut aussi développer de la coordination comme Denis le préciser très justement avec les autres secteurs, que ce soit la santé, que ce soit la protection, mais aussi livelihood, WASH, etc. Donc, il y a tout un travail de coordination et d'intersectorialité qui est mené par 
la, le, le secteur action contre les mines aujourd'hui sur ces différents terrains. Euh, donc, vous, acteurs de protection, euh, entendrez de plus en plus parler des acteurs euh, de l'action contre les mines dans l'identification, mais aussi l'orientation et le référencement de victimes et d'autres personnes qui ont des besoins similaires. Et je voulais juste préciser également, dans le cadre de, des, des frameworks, des, des, des cadres dans lesquels euh, l'assistance aux victimes est développée par le secteur du, de l'action contre les mines, qu'on s'appuie également sur des cadres plus larges euh, de respect des droits euh, humains, euh, et notamment la Convention sur les droits des personnes handicapées. Euh, et on va suivre des guidelines euh, qui sont aussi, euh, par exemple, l'inclusion euh, des personnes handicapées dans la réponse humanitaire, les, les guidelines YASC, qui sont assez récents également. Et puis aussi, pour certains pays qui sont euh, state party, euh, des conventions liées à l'interdiction des mines, à l'interdiction des cluster munitions ou à l'interdiction d'autres certaines euh, armes conventionnelles. Donc, l'assistance aux victimes prend aussi son empreinte dans toutes ces obligations légales que les gouvernements doivent mettre en œuvre et le secteur de l'action contre les mines vient appuyer aussi d'autres initiatives dans ce sens qui contribuent au, au case management. Uh, next slide, please. I think we will jump to the other one directly. Next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide? Je vais vous donner, uh, vous parler maintenant brièvement de deux exemples. Uh, if, can we move to the next slide, please? Example from Syria. Je vais vous juste vous introduire un, un exemple, deux exemples. Un exemple de Syrie et un exemple de, du Nigeria. Euh, en Syrie, on a créé, avec le, le soutien du cluster protection, euh, un working group, un Victim Assistance Working Group, un groupe de travail donc, pour l'assistance aux victimes, dans lequel on a rassemblé euh, différents acteurs de différents secteurs qui s'intéressent à la situation des personnes blessées, à la situation des personnes handicapées y compris les victimes d'engins explosifs. Pourquoi on a décidé de monter ce working group Vous me direz, c'est un working group supplémentaire, encore un. Il a été identifié la nécessité de faire un mapping des services qui pouvaient recevoir les personnes handicapées, car ça n'existait pas en Syrie. Et c'était absolument nécessaire de se pencher sur cette thématique-là. Donc voilà, là, le, le Victim Assistance Working Group a aidé et a euh, coordonné la création d'un mapping des services avec un dashboard qui est en ligne et accessible pour tous les acteurs. Ce qui permet aux acteurs, notamment de l'action contre les mines, d'avoir des informations sur les services existants et vers lesquels ils peuvent orienter et référer euh, les victimes. Can we move to the last slide for Nigeria au Nigeria, on a euh, déployé des équipes euh, car nous avions une image très cloisonnée et très parcellaire euh, de la situation des victimes. Et c'est encore le cas aujourd'hui. Donc, il a été décidé euh, de faire une, une, une étude sur la situation des victimes d'engins explosifs et pour cela, nous avons déployé des équipes spécifiques qui vont déterminer le profil des victimes, qui vont identifier les barrières d'accès aux services, qui vont consulter avec les survivants et les personnes avec des besoins similaires et qui vont aussi établir un mapping des services. Donc, vous voyez par ces exemples très concrets de ce que une masse fait sur le terrain, on voit le lien qui se fait avec ce que présentait Denis précédemment l'intersectorialité et la nécessité d'identifier, de faire des, des analyses de barrières aux services et en, pour pouvoir correctement orienter les victimes vers les services dont ils ont besoin. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Over to you, Anna. Thank you so much, Andre. We have a great question that is on self-reliance, self but I will ask you that. Um, 
after Carolina. So Carolina, I pass it off to you. Yes, thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, and apologies if I will need to keep my cameras off. Just the connection here in Sana is pretty weak. Um, so in my presentation, I don't know, Hannah, if you want to just share the main slide. Um, uh, um, is it possible to share the slides? On it's, um, I think it's challenges and opportunity, the slide. Should be right after Henri's. Julie's yes. just pulling it up now. So it's Perfect. not, it's <laughs> just, yeah, one main slide uh, with challenges and opportunities. And I'm gonna briefly talk about digitalization, program cycle management and complexity. Um, so these are some of the um, key uh, challenges that we have identified uh, when we talk about implementation of uh, case management uh, programming. Um, starting from digitalization, we want to speak a little bit about the challenges around the paper based systems and having proper organizations, um, ensuring that data protection protocols are in place and followed and possible uh, opportunities or solutions. Uh, for example, moving towards having online protection information management pl platform. Um, when we talk about case management as a form of protection assistance, uh, we are talking about being present uh, within the affected communities. Um, and there is a large number and uh, there is a large growing number of protection actors uh, on the ground gathering different information and analyzing uh, protection information. So um, we see a need to have a common understanding of mainly primary concept of uh, protection information management, which uh, should be particularly uh, important for the protection community. Um, so understanding uh, the, the protection information management concepts within uh, the, the uh, humanitarian communities should facilitate the, the targeted use of protection resources, as well as supporting us uh, to coordinate um, the protection responses. Um, if we think about uh, prior to the pandemic, um, despite the, the myriad of operating challenges um, on the ground, including, for example, insecurity, uh, access challenges, bureaucratic impediments, to, to mention just a few, um, most of the pre-COVID-19 protection work was conducted face-to-face, -face, um, especially to promote and create safe environment, uh, respecting privacy of uh, those uh, beneficiary who were assisted. However, the, the need to ensure infectious preventions and control um, following the onset of COVID-19 uh, put an abrupt limit to movements um, and most of the time also access to communities and individuals uh, that required humanitarian aid. And almost overnight, we have seen that the access to individuals and communities became extremely limited in many places. And these provided a major pressures on protection partners' ability to conduct individual case management um, and um, other services. And with the reduced mobility, loss of face-to-face -face contact, there has been a push towards digitalizations, including of cage management, which is an activity that continues to be uh, mostly paper-based and, and still rely heavily on paper-based uh, data, data entry. Um, and we know that the paperwork often requires a lot of time, um, a lot of uh, coordination and ability from different organizations to respond to single case might also be a challenge when, for example, systems among organizations are, are different. Um, so we see moving into having protection information management systems in place, such as PIM, represents an opportunity um, to, to mainly achieve better protection outcomes um, and also to increase collaborations between humanitarian actors to be able to provide a, a more effective response. Um, so the overall objectives of having a protection information management system should be to provide 
quality information and data on, on, on protections of displaced individuals and, and groups in the different um, types and phases of, of an operation and uh, of a situation and to do so in a safe, um, reliable and meaningful way. Uh, so we see um, information management as an opportunity not only to conduct case management activities, but also uh, to, to use information that are collected to produce uh, protection analysis, uh, but also to enable evidence-based decision-making and protection um, responses. So we, um, we see um, having like having to rely uh, a lot on a paperwork, paper-based work as, as, as a, a challenge for organizations, but moving towards digitalizations and establishing a strong information management system has a unique opportunity um, to put also the management of personal data at the center of um, case management activities programming. Um, moving into uh, program cycle management, um, I just want to speak a little bit how uh, sometimes protection organizations having to uh, design case management programming, they found themselves a little bit uh, constrained having to follow uh, grants that define the risks and cases predeterminately. And uh, what we see is an opportunity to um, basically keep a little bit more space to write grant broad enough uh, to allow protection organizations to take cases based off risks and, and needs. Um, designing a, a case management program, and usually prior to the design, it, it is really crucial to, uh, for example, understand the context, uh, conduct protection analysis to identify protection risks among the populations, um, including persons who are at heightened risk of protection violation, map resources, capacity services, um, also understand the extent of the availability and accessibility of the services to the populations and possibly conduct cost analysis. Um, and this is because costs for case management uh, can somehow be predicted, but might significantly vary because on the case individual needs and services uh, that the case will need to access. So the whole value of material support, for example, accommodation, referral services can have a significant impact on, on the cost level. Um, also for case management programs, um, heavily costs are usually also allocated towards personnel. And it's especially important to establish um, a robust staffing plan on the onset of a program to, to ensure that the staff resources are matched to, to the needs. So generating costs um, estimates from an office operating budget and expenses rather than individual donor reports can help to better capture the true resource cost. And, and based on these with donor budgeting is sometimes all like difficult to calculate fixed costs for implementing case management programming, um, especially when there is so much unknown about the case. Uh, for example, how much they will eventually cost, how long uh, they will take, the number of staff to hire for cases and maybe challenges around m &E. So we see that there is a need to increase the awareness uh, towards donor to allow flexibility in budgeting case management activities and programming, um, including, for example, allowing for having flexible budget lines and promote cost efficiency analysis for case management um, to, to mainly improve results uh, by calculating the cost of the organizations for providing case management services in a given setting um, during a given time. So, of course, specifying such costs and doing this analysis um, can be time consuming, but it's really important because it, it we think that it provides lessons about the structure of, of the program inputs and can really have uh, an important impact on how our case management uh, programming and activities. Um, 
one last uh, let's say challenge and uh, opportunity that we have identified is related to the complexity, um, mainly related to how risk-based programming um, versus the needs-based um, is still relatively new to the humanitarian sector. And with case management programming, we um, need to acknowledge uh, the, the complexities that we can, um, we can have uh, when coming across uh, cases we, we might get and, and working together with the clients to support them to, to achieve their goals. Um, and despite also the various steps and follow-ups that we might have uh, to make that might take different uh, time based on, on the needs of the, of the case. Uh, also, the complexity around case management might rely on, for example, service providers um, that are available in our areas of intervention and service providers who may or may not uh, take, take up case. Um, and this sometimes can depend um, on, on the grants and, and, and the criteria and how we, as, an, as protection organization implementing case management programming, we are meant to find solutions despite all these different obstacles. And um, opportunities that we see here um, are related, for example, to promotion of interagency case management, um, which could lead to, for example, increasing the capacities for referrals uh, by um, increasing the participation of uh, um, agency providing different kind of services, um, including not only uh, protection agencies, but also non-protection non -protection agencies um, working on, for example, integration, um, on, on having joint training and uh, developing, for example, joint um, learning events. Um, so here are just some of the challenges and opportunities in a broad, I would say, um, spectrum. Um, so Hannah, over to you. Thanks so much, Carolina. That was really wonderful. Um, so we're a little bit behind on time, but I want to pass over to Emily, who's going to talk to us about the next steps. We'll have time for a couple of questions and answers, and then we'll close. Emily, over to you. Thanks so much. Um, so I'll be trying to be super quick. Um, some of the next steps is we really want to socialize this guidance. Um, this is definitely something we would like to pilot. And so if you're interested in learning more and um, I mean, I sent through the guidance in the chat, but we can also send it through afterwards and you would like to pilot, please do get in touch with Hannah or myself. We're very interested to see how it goes for you. Um, one of the things we would like to do moving forward when we sort of learn and grow with this guidance is have more systematic engagement with national partners. Um, in the reference group, we did not have any national partners on, um, on the reference group, which is a, a real um, failing on our part, um, but we're hoping to over the next um, iterations and as we learn, be able to have that um, engagement more systematically. And then lastly, um, as you, I'm sure many of you know, GBV and CP have their own information management systems in Primero. Um, and right now the protection case management does not have an agreed upon information management system. And that is definitely something that we think is a real need and we would love to see in the future. Um, okay, I think that was quick and we can shift to a couple of questions before um, we close with BHA. Okay, fantastic. Well, just to say is that we know that there have been a lot of really fantastic questions coming out. So I think I'm okay saying this, we're gonna try and put all of those into an FAQ um, and then we'll put that onto the website wherever the PowerPoint's gonna be. So people's questions are actually gonna be answered. But I think um, for a couple of minutes, I have two questions, one for Emily and um, one for Esther. So Esther, I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about someone that had asked about PSNs. So potentially um, the, the framing around the case management guidance in terms of persons, persons with heightened risk, and then also um, the question about what happens with persons with special needs. And then Emily, following that, if you could speak a little bit about the 
how protection case management is connected to the protection analysis framework. So Esther, over to you. Okay. Um, I don't know if the person wants to ask exactly the question, if we have time for this. Uh, I've read it, but I think it would be helpful. Um, I think it was about um, discrimination if we're not including person with specific needs. So I will try to answer, but um, please feel free. Um, I am not saying that we are not serving persons with specific needs. Um, I was just trying to say that this is not the entry point um, for protection case management, and that the major shift is to say we are supporting person at protection risk or victims of rights violation. Um, if I go back to the example I was giving in the presentation, um, in the example, the woman was a widow, uh, she had epilepsy, she was untreated and diagnosed. So you had a lot of elements where you could actually say that woman might have specific needs. Might is very important, uh, but it seems she might have specific needs. But what was the entry point for protection case management in that example was the risk for her to be physically assaulted with her family because of witchcraft accusation, okay? So I'm not saying that through protection case management, you wouldn't address um, the serious medical conditions or um, maybe the specific needs she might face. But I was saying that as protection stakeholders, the entry point is the risk of physical assault. Um, and this is the right violation or the violence we're trying to respond to. And we're not just assuming that we are working with all widows or all people with medical, serious medical conditions. We are working with those people, of course, but if they are facing a risk or if they have been victim of a right violation, a violence. I hope this is clear. And please feel free to ask if it wasn't clear. <laughs> Thanks so much, Esther. And yeah, if that wasn't clear, just put it into the chat. And as I said, we will put it into an FAQ that we'll create after the presentation. Emily, over to you. Great. I'm super excited that the um, protection analytical framework was brought up. So thank you for that question. That's great. Um, it, it was actually, they were developed or they were um, conceptualized at around the same time. And a lot of the approach that is outlined in the, um, in the path is actually in the protection case management gu guidance itself. The whole shift around risk analysis is um, articulated together and we're actually working super closely with them. Um, the visuals don't match as much because the, that project has a lot of really amazing designers. <laughs> And our project was a little bit more Excel based. Um, so it doesn't look the same, but it, it, the theory behind it is the same. And as we go through different iterations, we hope to sort of match that up. But um, the protection risk equation and that engagement is 100% included in all of the different components of protection case management, both on, as Esther was talking about, the importance of the contextual protection risk analysis as a way to inform our targeting criteria, and as well as how we support each individual case and to really analyze um, the risks that they may face, their own sort of strengths and capacities, um, and as well as their individual vulnerabilities. So that balance is incorporated on both levels. So thanks for that question. <laughs> Thanks so much, Emily. So now we have about two minutes left. So I have the great pleasure to pass it off to our um, end speaker, Laura Solzman from the um, Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. Laura, over to you. Great. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hannah. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be here to represent the US government to provide a donor perspective, but really just to be here to learn how this initiative will move forward. Um, it's very timely. We, like you all, have been seeing a clear need to broaden our protection support. Uh, this really hit our radar in the Venezuela crisis response. It just keeps coming up um, for me personally and ones I've covered um, in Central America and Afghanistan. I was also thinking uh, earlier today, there was a session on preparedness for climate change protection needs that also I think really underscored the need for broader protection support, how it's always going to increase and we just need to be better prepared as a community. And this syncs well with several of the initiatives on our minds currently, just in terms of our priorities for the coming year. 
uh, from the US government perspective, meeting these growing broader protection needs involves focusing attention and resources on supporting the people that are most often providing case management. And we've been looking very closely at the social worker workforce. So looking forward, we're hoping to work across the nexus within our own agency to see if there are ways that we could support the growth of the social worker workforce in different contexts, uh, in different disaster affected areas. And to make good on that effort, we also, both we in the US government and as a community, uh, must continue to generate and roll out resources like this that are fit for purpose and user friendly for these essential staff that will be using them. Uh, it's challenging because we need to build on what's already there as a foundation, yet also innovate and streamline to bridge gaps. Um, I really also appreciated Carolina's point that we need to build flexibility into budgets and timelines in recognition that one size just does not fit all. Um, all this was part of the logic behind our support for the Child and Adolescent Survivors Initiative, which in a way similarly addressed this issue of adapting case management systems to better serve a specific group of clients. And as William said so beautifully earlier, and as Esther, Dennis, Henri, and Carolina demonstrated, protection case management speaks to a significant part of our mandate, yet we're still on a path to institutionalizing the approach and really scaling it to the great need. Um, we often say among the USAID protection team and also to our PRM counterparts that we really strive to support the whole community to build on what works. And this session is such a strong example of how experts from so many specialties and different contexts can come together to do exactly that. So thanks again to the organizers and the presenters and all the participants and, and really a huge thank you to everyone who works on finding these tough solutions day in and day out. That's it. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you so much, Laura. Well, thank you everybody for taking the time out of your Friday and being with us today. We really appreciate it um, to have this conversation into the session. And we have our information on the screen here if you have any questions for Emily or I. And yeah, have a fantastic either end of your Friday or beginning of your Friday for those of us, those of you who are in Latin America. Thank you.